All right, folks, join us now for the Farmer to Farmer panel. We're going to be talking to what I think um, are some of the most interesting individuals that I've ever met. They're all pretty smart, too. So if you don't mind, just grabbing your seat and let's get started. A couple housekeeping notes. We do have certified crop advisor credits being offered both days. And I've got a, a, a checkoff sheet there in the back. There's a QR code now. So if you are wanting to get the continuing ed credits, just uh, go back to that back table and you can get all the information that you need. Also, stick around. After the second panel, we are going to have a social. We have charcuterie boards and some light appetizers that will be provided by Ellen Moeller of um, Mulberry Lane Greenhouse and Garden. There will also be some adult beverages for you to sample at that time. So without much further ado, we do have the Farmer to Farmer panel. And I'm going to sit down. So we have Todd Tobin here from Iuka, Kansas. We have Jimmy Emmons. Russell Hedrick, and Chris Olmsted. So I think let's just kind of start down at the end here. Todd, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your operation. Todd Tobin. I think most of you know me right here in Pratt County. Um, we started integrating uh, cover crops, cattle, um, regenerative ag practices as much as we can uh, in the last five to ten years. And uh, we're in Northwest Pratt County, farm about 7,000 acres. Jessica's trying to get her attention over here, I think. So. I think she's trying to get a hold of Shannon. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Emmons, Northwest Oklahoma, uh, producer, farmer, rancher uh, there. We've been working in regenerative ag about 10 years. Um, we've been through some challenges, uh, wildfires and droughts and whatnot. Um, but uh, we've learned a lot and we got hopefully a lot to share and hopefully Jessica will be all right here in just a minute. You guys can take over. Shannon. Shannon. I, th I think Shannon was acting up and she kicked him too hard and hurt her knee the other day. So I'm, I'm Russell. Just talked to y'all a minute ago. As y'all know, I'm not from around here. Um, so on our farm, we haven't used prairie food yet. Um, we are going to be uh, using it this coming year in a lot of our trials. But the one thing that makes me excited about prairie food is we do integrate livestock into our farm, but we can't put it on all our acres because some of our landlords where we lease, they see cattle as a liability. Um, we're hoping that this is going to be a way for us to, to bridge that gap and, and bring a manure-based source product uh, onto our ground. And that Haney test that we talked about earlier, we're measuring what they call WEOC or water extractable organic carbon. And it's a, it's a short chain carbon product for us to be able to apply to the ground to help that microbial pool. Chris Olmstead, farm 30 miles west of Wichita, pretty much all no-till. Uh, this is my first year for uh, prairie food. Uh, notice a significant difference in yield in Milo, dry land Milo. Uh, we tried on irrigated and dryland beans also. Just think it's the way to go. And grease uh, organic matter quite a bit in just a few months. So we'll see what happens. Any questions from the audience? Hello, I'm Jessica Nab. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not blind, are you? <laughs> Well, Russell, hello, I'm Gail Fuller. I'm a recovering conventional farmer. <laughs> Russell, you stunned them into silence, or you got them all so mad they don't want to speak? So if no one has any questions, oh, we have one in the back. So being in northwest Pratt County or west of Wichita in a dryland situation, you talk a little bit about your experience with cover crops, uh, and moisture management in that regard? In, in my case so far, we, we use a lot of moisture probes and we'll see the same kind of data that uh, Russell alluded to earlier. The cover crops um, will allow us to harvest the rainfall. Our, our rainfall generally comes in big rains in the spring. And we generally, I'll admit my summer covers, um, we're still playing with those. 
um, but that's that's a whole different breed of breed of cover. Mine are, are mainly winter covers, and it allows us to harvest that rainfall in the spring, and then through the the mulching effect of that that cover or that biomass, it extends the water holding capacity. I'm I'm in fairly sandy ground, and uh, we just have very little water holding capacity. The the nutrient cycling and the water cycling has improved tremendously with the use of the cover crops. Yeah, and I think it's all about the, the principles of soil health as well. It's just not about the cover. I mean, the, the cover is, is one tool in that system, but it's not the complete system that you got to look at. It, and I experienced the same thing. I have moisture probes out as well. And we'll see some water use out of them cover crops, but not as much as we're evaporating in the summer. We, in, in western Oklahoma, where I'm from, and, and probably up here as well, you, you can have a half inch to three quarters of an inch a day in some of the peak evaporation days. And, and you're not gonna use that much water with a cover crop. So you keep that cooler and keep that ground covered and apply that, that, that basic principle of, of that on the ground. And it will start regenerating and then that water holding capacity, that infiltration rate starts going up. So when you do have them big swings, that, that big rainfall event that may dump two, three, four, five, six inches at a time out, Instead of running off everything but a half inch of that, you start capturing that. And as you start capturing that, then you start recovering that loss that you use from growing that cover. So it, it's more about applying the principles and, and getting to that point, I believe. What I've noticed is the ground temperature. If you measure a bare ground versus something that's got a cover crop, there's about 20 degree difference in the middle of the summer and in heat of the day. That makes a big difference. I like just planting wheat or rye and killing it. You say that was before sorghum? After sorghum. After sorghum. Um, this year, I actually bought a Hagee unit, and we're, we're running the, the row crops in August. And uh, I blew on rye, turnips, crimson clover, uh, hairy vetch, common vetch, in, in different, different mixes across it. Um, Last year when we did that, um, I got on the dry land, we got an inch 20, thought we had the world by the tail and then it just turned off bone dry. And out of about 700 acres, we had a, probably 400 that were fantastic and 300 that I had to run the drill back across to, to spot it in because it, it was very spotty to, to, to non-existent. So we'll, we'll use companion crops with the grain sorghum while it's growing. We'll have a buckwheat in there, a mung bean, uh, uh, some flax. There's about six or seven different things in there that we grow with that down in the understory as we're doing that. And then as soon as we harvest, and we're just now starting with our double crop milo harvesting at home. And then we'll follow that with oats, barley, wheat, and rye mix uh, as soon as the combine leaves the field. Uh, are you interceding on that milo that's digger companion crops? We are. Um, but generally, you're through through the peak water use. Hey, Todd. He said, he said get it pretty close. Oh, we're, we're through the peak water use generally when we're interceding that. Um, and so far, we haven't, haven't gotten slapped on the wrist yet. And rules and regulations are coming down the pike. They're, they're going to change. Where interseeding and and intercropping, are, they're going to be looked at differently. Uh, just the world we live in, there's there's going to make changes in crop insurance and FSA rules. So we've done a little of both. In the early years, we drilled uh, on 15s, and then we had our our mix, our companions on 15s in in between. Uh, this year, we planted with 30 inch planter, and then we we cross drilled. Uh, the companions in at the same time uh, following the planter. Um, and, you know, both work. Um, it's a little bit extra expense to do that, but I like the, the road uh, grain sorghum a little bit better than the, the drill. We got a little bit better uh, planting depth and, and seed to soil in that context. So still trying to figure all that out, but we really liked what we saw this year. Oh, talk in the mic. Talk in the mic. 
add days of uh, grazing to it is the reason we want to go in there in late August, early September and get that established. Then when the combine pulls off, you throw a fence around it and you can start grazing immediately. All right, folks, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of context here. The reason why I asked these gentlemen to join me on the panel today is that we have a good mix of not only operations, we've got a good mix of geography, we've got a good mix of you know annual precipitation, soil type. And so um, we've got this slide here in the back about the five core principles of regenerative agriculture. So my thought here is just to highlight a little bit of the work that each of you are doing on your, your individual farms. And starting with Todd Tobin, um, we've had the honor and pleasure to work with Todd Tobin for close to 20 years. And um, there's been a lot of boots on the ground learning that myself and my husband Shannon have been able to do because of Todd's willingness um, to try new things, to be conservation minded. And that was the reason why I brought Todd on the panel. Also, Todd is at about 7,000 acres, and I had the pleasure of doing an interview with him recently. He has got cover crops now on almost all of those acres, or is it 100%, Todd? It's 100% irrigated and probably 80% um, on existing dry land. And the new, new ground coming on, we haven't yet. So I do remember the first cover crop experience. Uh, not really knowing about putting together the mixes. What, what would you say is the biggest catalyst for you deciding that your irrigated needed to be 100% cover cropped? We tried it on a, on a smaller scale. Um, found out we can drastically cut our chemical use um, behind the rye for, for multiple reasons. Uh, getting that mat down, and we don't crimp. Uh, but getting that mat down and being able to uh, to reduce them input costs, um, planting green. Uh, I'm, I actually list, went to no-till on a plane several years ago when Jimmy first started talking. And uh, the main, this standing room only everywhere he talked mm -hmm. because everybody wanted to go hear the guy that was growing cover crops in an area that gets about 15 inches of rain a year. And that was huge. I don't know why they called it no-till on the plains that year because it should have been more green planting and cover crops. It had really shifted. I hadn't been for a few years, and then uh, it was an eye-opening experience to, to listen to those ideas and, and what other people have been doing around the country. Yeah, so Jimmy, down there in Dewey County, Oklahoma, I call you my farmer-rancher friend. And one time I asked you, how do I know if you're a farmer or a rancher? And you told me it depends on which hat you have on that day. And so tell me a little bit about um, when you first started doing this, the word regenerative wasn't really a part of the vocabulary. So same question along the same lines. What was a catalyst for you to understand that you needed to incorporate what we're talking about here on 100%? So we'd been trying no-till since 1995. <clears throat> and once again, Gail mentioned it a while ago, I'm a recovering tillage act, just like Gail. And you know, that's what we grew up on. And so even though I started no-till and I still had the mindset that I, I needed all the residue gone, it needed to be clean, uh, you know, in the fallow season with not a weed growing. And it, it wouldn't work because, you know, the extreme heat, uh, lack of moisture, uh, we were evaporating, just like I said a while ago, a lot more water than we ever dreamed we were. Our infiltration rates at that time were about a half inch an hour. Um, and some of y'all was down at the field this year uh, where we stopped the pivot and, and let it set for two hours, Dot, and we put on seven inches, a little over, run the gauge over for about 30 minutes, um, and we shut the pivot off, and we walked right into the, the pivot, no mud, uh, and that, that infiltration rate is shot up so that when we have them huge rainfall events now, I like to say I got it all. Uh, and not, not how much I used to have was, you know, I just got a half inch and everything else run off, much like what Russell showed a while ago, uh, and Trish as well, uh, down the stream. So it's all about how much we retain, not how much it rains. And uh, that, that, them principles, that's the reason they're the key. You, you can't just do one. It, it, it's kind of like marriage. It, it, you got to be all in. And it's a give and take, and it's working with the system 
instead of against it. And that's the reason I like companion cropping is it, you got a companion to work with. It's not that it's trying to overtake your cash crop. It's, it's to, to help and assist it. And so we've learned a lot in the last 10 years. And do we have it all figured out? No. Uh, and we probably won't have uh, for several more years because every time we think we got something figured out, six more questions show up that like, wow, we've never seen that before. Wow, that's a positive benefit. It's like the prairie foods, like when we apply ideas, like, oh my gosh, uh, man, w this is something like we've never experienced before. So uh, I think it's an ongoing education, Jess, and, and I don't think we're near there yet. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about how to make it rain in a couple more questions, but Russell, your experience is a little bit different. So correct me, you're about 55 inches of annual precipitation, but you, a lot of your total acres is spread out. You have a, a multiple counties that you guys are operating in. And I did an interview with you one time about how you start, when you take over new ground, you have a system that you utilize on new ground. Can you talk a little bit about what you do with that new ground system and what lessons you've learned a little bit? Well, so first, your and Ginger's marriage is regenerative, not sustainable. Is that what I'm? You're putting words in my mouth now. I'm, I'm just a young man trying to learn. I, just, I didn't know we were getting life lessons again today. Well, after 40 years, uh, <laughs> you've got to learn that it's a give and take. So, so um <laughs> So Jessica's question, um, typical rainfall where I'm at in North Carolina from essentially harvest season when you don't want it to rain until about March, we get about 30 inches of rainfall. So harvest is usually just, well, this year corn harvest was the best we've probably had in the 10 years I've been farming. And then beans was just terrible trying to fight the rains. Um, but so we'll get all this winter rain and if you're lucky, it'll rain in April and May. And then if you're not, it just rains all April, never stops. And then it just drought goes in. For, we're about 10 days away from a drought in North Carolina. Um, but our annual rainfall should be about 45 inches a year. Uh, 2018, with two hurricanes, we were over 100 inches of rain in, annually in Catawba County. Um, we, we literally had houses underwater that year. It was absolutely insane. So when, when, we pick, when we pick up farms, it's typically what other farmers give up. So um, the field you saw in the pictures up there where we made the 113 bushel soybean yield and the new state record, we picked up that farm because another farmer had leased it for about 10, 15 years. And the resistant weeds on that farm were so bad between mare's tail and pigweed that they couldn't grow a good crop and they walked away from that lease. Um, and I've got slides about five years after we started farming that farm. Uh, we placed second that year with 86 and a half bushel beans. Um, and then this year, uh, we, we finally broke the 100, year, or 100 bushel mark. But, you know, we pick up ground that was uh, tillage for tobacco or, um, you know, overgrazed, overpastured. And then uh, we get these amazing trees called prickly pear trees. They're like a wild pear tree and they get a thorn on them. And my hands have scars from, you know, digging them out of fields. But we pretty much reclaim land. And if it's that bad of a piece of property that we know, you know, looking at a Haney test, the soil health score is low, the soil respiration is low, we'll typically put a summer cover crop and a winter cover crop and try to get animal integration into that farm to actually build the soil to where we can actually finally grow a crop on it before we go into crop production. And I know, I know as a farmer, that's not a huge return on investment as, as a grain farmer, but if we're direct marketing, like what we're gonna talk about in the workshop tomorrow, we sell 90% of our beef and pork on Facebook Marketplace. And we're getting $5 a pound for our beef. Um, sausage is anywhere from five to seven a pound. I had a lady call me one time, said she wanted to buy a whole hog and she wanted it all in bacon. Um, <laughs> that goes back to the direct marketing funds of this world, but um, it just goes to show you how, how disconnected people are from the food that we eat. Um, so, you know, the, the thing about it is, is, is you really have to look at your ground is if you improve your ground in say a year or two and make it more profitable on the grain side, is it better to do that versus suffer 
for five or six years trying to fit this system inside of a grain model. I'd rather take the two years and just, you know, get by on the meat production and then bring it into a really good grain production than trying to suffer for five or six years. And you really got to think outside the box on it. Thanks, Russell. So, Chris, you're up in Nebraska with Olmstead Ag Services, and you're the type of guy who... West of Wichita. You're what? West of Wichita. West of Wichita. My notes told me Nebraska. Are you sure? I like the Huskers, but I'm west of Wichita. <laughs> well, we'll forgive you for that one. Um, so, Chris, just working on um, adding no-till into the operation, what are some lessons that you've taken for that? And what are you thinking about towards the future? Because um, I've talked a lot with Chan Mazur, who, who works with you, um, and, and just what are you looking to explore right now as, you know, maybe that initial step into no-till, and where are you going with the operation? Well, I just started farming in 2010, and I was all... I'll till, plowed every acre. I started to get bigger, so then I switched to no-till just for a speed. And uh, I don't know what, dealing with Chan, I, I want to cut my fertilizer costs. They just keep going up and up, and I just think it's the way to go. Yeah, so looking at it right now just as a solution, um, what's, what's a big takeaway that you've learned on the how? You know, because I think we hear that a lot. You know, I want to I want to slash the the price, but how are you doing that at this point on the operation? Well, I tried prairie food and fertilizers on some crops this year, and I, I reduced the rate of the the synthetic fertilizer, and the prairie food out yielded it quite a bit. So hopefully, we can reduce the synthetic even more next year, and hopefully, totally in a few years. So, Jimmy, I'm going to kind of angle this question for you because I've got this slide here, and it's the slide from Trisha Jackson's presentation, and it's about the five core principles of regenerative agriculture. And I think maybe that's something we should just review here for a second. I view that these are principles that these farmers up here are trying to achieve. We're talking a lot about practices, but... I think that, you know, Jimmy, and you can reiterate this, the practices in which Jimmy utilizes to fulfill a principle might look different depending on where he, he's at, and we call that place-based. So, Jimmy, can you talk a little bit about, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about reduced inputs, we're talking about tillage, we're talking about all these practices, but let's shift it into why you work on the, the principles of regenerative agriculture. Well, first of all, it's, it's like building a house. It, it you, you've got to start with the foundation. You, you got to keep that minimize soil disturbance. You can't, you can't start building the foundation and, and then start breaking it up and, and trying to, to redo it. You know, that's the basic principle that you, you have to get down is minimize disturbance. And like you said earlier today, it's not about zero. I mean, we have feral pigs that come in and do some tilling for me. And uh, they they don't do a do very good job leveling. So every once in a while, we have to do a little maintenance. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, we'd like to be zero, uh, but sometimes uh, you just can't always do what you want. You know, you got to maximize crop diversity. That's where I really like the companion system. Uh, and, and also the relay. We, we've got a, a relay crop we're trying right now with sesame and sweet clover. Now, we don't have the outcome of that yet, but we think that's got a great possibility. It's about the diversity. That's the reason that, that if you look at the native prairie and, and our, our pastures out there, that they just didn't have a grass growing like a Bermuda grass or, or a single species. They were multiple species. And there was something always, always flourishing. Something would come up, do its thing. Something else would come. And, and much like us, animals like the diversity when they eat. They, they don't like. They will eat just wheat pasture, but if you put a diverse mix in there, they'll do better because they like it. Keeping it covered, we talked about that, about the evaporation rate. You keep that soil 20, 30 degrees cooler or warmer in the wintertime. It, it's cr critical. The, the microbiome is just like us. If Todd has a flat out here in, in July, early August on the asphalt on the truck coming to town and up the road about where them doors are back there, there's a shade tree. Is he going to limp on up there and change the tire under the shade tree, or is he just going to get on the asphalt and change the tire? 
The microbiome is just like us. They have to have a working temperature that you can live in. You can't live in 130 degree soil temperature. And you can see that in bare soil in the summertime out here. And so you got to provide a habitat for them to live and function and work for you. And then a living root year round. And, and some people from here north say, well, that's very challenging. It is. It gets more challenging. Where Russell's at, he has a, a better opportunity of that. But, you know, the thing about it is if you keep it covered and keep it warm where the, the, the microbiome can work, you can do that. I, I've seen in North Dakota under the snow green living plants in 25 below zero. So, you know, you can do that. And so that's a very important part of that. And then the livestock. If you looked at the prairie, it, it was not just bison roaming around out there. There were deer, antelope, elk, jackrabbits, coyotes, cougars, bears. I mean, you just go down the list, it was alive and the system was functioning. And that's the way it was created that it feeds on one another. There's always something. Trish talked about that today. And, and, and Rob talked about that at the ribbon cutting ceremony this morning. It's about, it grows up, it does its thing, it falls down, it recycles through and comes back. That's the living system of the five principles. And so you can't apply one without the other, much like building a house. You gotta have a foundation, you gotta have the walls, you gotta have the windows, you gotta have the roof to keep it covered and all that in, in that system, Jess. Yeah, and I think that's why I've heard Gail talk about um, no-till alone won't do the trick. So Todd, I wanna talk about logistics with the Hagee. So first of all, it's two-part question. I want you to, can you tell us what the Hagee is? And um, I wanna know what do you have to change about your cropping system to be able to use a Hagee? Basically, the Hagee is a high clearance row crop sprayer, and uh, they came out with a model that they put a dry box on it that you can interseed cover crops, fertilizer over the standing crops. Um, we was able to, to find one of these this summer, and uh, as soon as we got it here, we were running behind the eight ball, which is normal because we're always behind. And we started running that thing, and we got it across about 2,800 acres in two, two and a half weeks. We was, interseeded uh, rye and, and clover, hairy vetch, common vetch, uh, turnips, radishes. Um, again, we, we want, we've seen the benefits of that rye cover um, going into next spring. Um, my goal with, with getting the Hagee and putting it down early enough that we can, can add grazing days if you'd asked me five years ago if we was going to have the amount of cattle running on this, I'd have said you were nuts. I'd, I never really wanted to be around cattle. Granddad, when Mom remarried, he, he had a dairy. And if anybody wants to have cattle after being around a dairy, you're, you're a special type of person. <laughs> I, I didn't necessarily want the cattle, but I looked at the cattle as a way to help pay for the cover crops because it's, it's not a, a cheap day. It, it does help to offset on your chemical costs, but it still costs quite a bit to get those cover crops seeded and get them growing. So I thought, well, if we can add cattle, and if they can just pay for my cover crop, we'll have covers to plant in the spring. We'll just do a light grazing, work with a guy that's easy to work with. You know, you don't want it to look like that cement floor when they pull off. My main goal is to have a cover crop at the end of the day. If we can put cattle on there, it's all the, more, all the better. We get that them dollars off there. It turned out um, turned a, a, a very good profit this year, um, over and above what's paying for our cover crop. So, what stage do you run that Hagee, and do you need to plant the corn differently, and do you need to seed the cover crop any differently than than you would? I'm trying to identify like what are some somebody we're, might be objecting. Well, I don't want to change this, or I don't want to change that. We're running in August, um, second and third week of August in the corn. This year our corn was the tallest I think I've ever seen it in, in my lifetime. It was a foot into the truss rods. Um, I was a little nervous about breaking corn off. Uh, we didn't, it flexed over, we got along fine with it. As far as changing any other practices, we really don't have to change anything. You can go right in through the corn, the milo. We ended up doing about three circles of milo. 
Um, we don't do beans. Um, we tried that once years ago. If you're not Johnny on the spot and get them beans out, then you're cutting silage. And around here, if you have a week of war or week of moisture and you can't cut beans for a week, you're going to severely hamper that harvest trying to get them beans out. So we do the beans after the fact. Uh, we don't usually graze them. They're just covers for next year into, and planting into. But as far as changing anything we've done, it's not really changing. It's just adding to it. So who else here is working on livestock? Chris, are you guys, is that a thought process right now? I don't run any cows on anything because uh, if it gets wet and they track it up, then I have a hard time with seed placement in the spring. That was my question for Todd. What do you guys do when something like that happens? We strip till. Um, and, and it's about, especially on the irrigated, it's critical to get emergence. So we, we strip till almost all of our row crops in. Sometimes on dry land we don't, but on all of our irrigated, it's strip tilled to get a, a better seed bed. Um, normal years, you won't have an issue, um, but a wet year, yeah, if you leave them hoof prints and then they dry, it's like planting on a washboard, and you're not going to get, um, the main thing there is getting, getting emergence, even emergence. So, so 2018, when we had that 100 inches of rain, um, we always had a plan for sacrifice areas, and I never really understood what that was until that year. Um, but we essentially, we, we packed the cattle down as tight as we could get them in a corner of a field where we, you know, essentially ran our equipment in and out and the trucks in and out for harvest. And they, they decimated it. And I mean, we bell grazed them for almost three months just because of so much rain. So, I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna in integrate the livestock component of it, I, I definitely have a plan in place, especially for, for wet weather, because it is a possibility if we get a really wet fall. So having my rancher hat on, uh, we, we have a cow-calf operation at well, so this really integrated very well for us. And, and what we quickly found out was it's all about the residue. And, and the more you got, the less impact you have. Uh, and, and now, we do have big rainfall events, too. Uh, in 2011, we had 7 inches. In 12, we had 9 inches. And in 14, we had 25 24.3 the month of May. So we can't have, and I tell everybody, our rainfalls give or take the entire rainfall. I mean, if it's 20 inches, we can get 24 inches in one, one month. But what we found is, early on, I was so afraid of too much residue. And, and you know, we can't plan in that. We're going to have to strip till. We're going to have to do different things to make this work. But once you get that biological system really going, it, it's hard to feed them enough. And so now the challenge is to grow enough and keep enough cover out there. But really, we don't, where I'm at, we don't have the, the trouble with the compaction unless we get into a big weather event like we did in, in 2014. And you have to have that sacrifice area. But what we found is, and I don't know how yours recovered, but you think you just totally ruined it and it, it will never come back. Mother Nature has this great ability that, that it can heal anything. You just got to give it the proper rest. And it may take longer, uh, just like a wildfire. We were talking about that earlier in the 2018 fire where we got completely burned out. It, where my friends and neighbors didn't give that range and them, them fields the proper rest, uh, they really suffered. Where we give it the, the proper long-term rest that it needed, uh, it recovered very nicely. But once again, it was all about getting the cover back out there and getting that, everything protected. It wasn't about capturing the first bite of grass that was available, even though we drastically needed that. What's long-term rest? What's a long-term rest? It, it, it's, it's like, how tired are you? Do, do, <laughs> do, do, do you need an overnight, or have you been harvesting for three days straight and you need days of rest. It depends on the impact. And then big sacrifice areas, it, maybe it's a year, maybe it's a year and a half if, if you just totally decimate it. But it, it depends on the situation. It, it's not one thing if you, if you take this, if you don't take anything else out of the conference, is you got to understand the, the impact and give it the fair rest for the impact. If you 
just a little bit of impact, you don't have to have that long a rest. If you decimate it and, and, and just totally destroy it, that looks like it's been tilled, then it's going to need a longer rest. So there's no recipe that, that it's this long. It, it's how big of impact did you have on it and, and, and how well is it recovering. And you, you got to use them eyes. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's weather dependent, growing season, length of days to the first freeze, all that plays into effect. It, and I know that's not answering your question, but, but that's the way it is. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, we'll send Gail around with the roving microphone. So get your audience questions ready to go. I think one thing that's really important is I don't want to paint a picture of Disneyland farming. And I have said this, if you've ever attended any events or any, any forums or webinars that we do, we need to have a whole conference on what went wrong. Okay, because if you're not doing something wrong, then you're not learning. I stole that from Rick Clark. So what I want to ask you guys, and this is kind of the truth serum right now, is there any one thing that you were just hell-bent was the right way to do it, and you were going to do it, and you were going to, you know, be in this space because it was soul health regenerative that just did not work? And Chris, go, <laughs> go for it. Plant and rise a cover crop, and then if it gets too wet and you can't kill it on time, then you got big issues, especially on rented ground. I feel like we could be friends. <laughs> I'm going to play off of that. So I, th I think this, um, I think this is a good message for Kansas. Um, the cover crops that I plant in North Carolina will work here, but way, way less rate. So if we're planting 60, 70 pounds in North Carolina, you're probably 15 to 20 pounds in Kansas. And it's all based on water. And my great experience was um, we planted a rye cover crop before beans, and we did it at 60 pounds. Phenomenal results. The next fall, I was like, Shh, 60 was good, 120 is better. Um, so we did these plots all across this field, and we went like 60, 90, 120, and I think we even had 180. And we planted corn into this, and it made good worse 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 and like the more we went up in rate so more is not always the the key concern that you should go after because i think we took almost 100 bushel to the acre yield hit where we had the 120 and 180 pound rye crop so um you've you've got three great people that are here in the west you've got um kansas soil health alliance i know michael thompson and some great people are working with them as well um do the same thing I did. I had great mentors that were in North Carolina that came out with a video called Undercover Farmers. Just call these guys up. Like, most conventional farmers don't want to talk about what they're doing. Most, you know, regenerative farmers want to share and help people, and that's the only reason we've had the success we've had is other people willing to share that information. So sometimes you got to swallow a little pride and, and make a phone call and, and see what people are already doing in your area. Uh, to really see that maximum benefit, so. So, as Todd talk, talked about a little bit a while ago, I started speaking a few years ago, and then people started to ask me uh, to consult or, or help them. I don't know if you've ever heard of Brahms or Brahms Farms, but they've got a huge farm at Shattuck, Oklahoma. And they reached out to me because year before last, it looked like the 30s. It's very sandy, very rolling. I got 158 pivots out there, and it was all blowing. And it was terrible. And so I went out there, and I told them, I said, we, you got to get rye planted. When you're going to harvest, either you get a hagee and intercede in that with pivots, or as soon as you get the combine, you got to get it planted. And they, and they did that the following year. And, man, everything was going fine. And in the spring, I get this call, Jess. It's like, Jimmy, you're going to cost me your job. This is a farm manager out there. We can't plant through this rye. And I said, well, tell me what's wrong with the planter. You know? And it's like, well, no, we just can't get through the rye. You don't understand. I planted 128 pounds of rye, and they irrigated it, and it was taller than Russell's hat <laughs> while he's standing under it. And uh, I said, okay, once again, tell me what the planter issue is. Why, why can't you plant through it? And, and 
he rattled on a little bit, and I finally said, Jim, listen to me. Tell me what's wrong with the planter. And he said, well, these dang windrows, I can't get through them. <laughs> okay. What's causing the windrows? Well, we couldn't plant through it, so we started mowing. I said, stop. He said, oh, we did. We're disking now, but it's, it's, it, it's taken four diskings to get it, get it under where we can plant through it. And I said, all right, stop, 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 stop now. Tell me my original question, what's wrong with the planter? Well, I don't think we can plant through it. I said, you haven't even tried yet. And it hadn't. And so I, I called Russell and I said, send me some videos of your worst nightmare where you're planting in Hat High Rye. And I, done it, I got another friend in uh, Tennessee, Adam Doherty. He's, and I sent these videos to him. I said, your planter, it's 92 foot wide, a brand new John Deere they pull with a 600 horsepower tractor. It's quite capable of planting. He was out of his comfort zone so far that he didn't even try. Well, in 30 minutes, he called me and he said, you may get me fired, but we're planting. And he sent me this video, and I mean, they're just moving along at five mile an hour as smooth as, as could be going through that. And then he said, now what do we do? And I said, well, you need a roller crimper or something. And by the way, they're, they're going to try to stop devastators. They're, they're in the process of that. But he said, well, we've got this roller that we prepare alfalfa ground for, and they pulled it. Long story, but here's the short version of it. It worked great. Their e water efficiency on their irrigation got so much better because they laid all that on the ground. Their weed suppression, their chemical bill went down. And now he's the smartest farm manager Brahms has ever had <laughs> out there. But it was a, a very big nightmare for me, and I thought it was my biggest failure of sticking yourself out there because when you, and they didn't listen to me when I said do small things, leave check strips, you know, they planned 75 pivots to start with. Oh. And, uh, but now they're all in 100%. So th there is things that you go through that, 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 Gale, we fall back into that with panic mode. Uh, they went back to disking. They went back to mowing. It's like, stop. And, that, and I, I experienced that myself. The first cover crop I tried to plant in was as tall as my tractor cab in the fall. And I was planting wheat into it. And it's like, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's not going to work. And once again, just like them, I didn't even try. And so I run a vertical tillage over it. And, and I started, and I thought, okay, I got to listen to Russell. I got to leave check strips, and I, I started leaving that. And then I thought, doggone, Jimmy, you said you were all in, and you're going to go by all these principles, and you're violating that. And so I quit. And the next harvest, when I harvested that, strip by strip, guess what the yield difference was? Zero. And, and I tell everybody, it's like an anvil fell out of the sky and hit me that I spent 80 grand on a new vertical tillage disc, pulling it with a $200,000 tractor to make zero. And so that's when I went all in, and, and I'm not going back. <laughs> but I thought, holy crap. <laughs> I don't know if we've had a major major failure since we started lots of little things you learn change different things every year um probably the biggest thing that mother nature come in and and schooled us real quick was diversity in the in the mixes which i've need to i have to improve on that um a couple of years ago we planted mainly the cheapest feed i could find on our summer covers and had a little problem called sugarcane aphids they wiped it out completely wiped it out in a matter of a month, it was gone. Luckily, I had a few other covers underneath there that, that held it through the rest of the winter, but if I hadn't done that, I'd had to go in there and drill it now, all back to weed or rye. But, uh, and the diversification of the, of the cover crop mixes, that's a hard call, and that, that's something we're working on every year. We'll add a little bit every year and, and see if they work. Well, I really wanna thank you gentlemen for your transparency, being willing and open to talk about 
um, the things that are working and things are not. So let's go ahead and uh, take it out to the audience here. I'll have Gail, as it turns out, I'm just going to sit here for a while. Um, but I'll have Gail take the, the microphone around. So raise your hand if you have a question. So while I'm headed back there, would it be fair to say that fear of failure leads to failure? Um, I was just wondering, what are all the different enterprises you guys do, and how do you have time to manage all those yourself? That's a trade secret. <laughs> I'm doing good with this, manage one. <laughs> so so it, that management side of that is uh, an, another obstacle, and, and you can look at it an obstacle or an opportunity. And, and we chose uh, to go from raising two crops, what we used to do, to up to as many as 14, and then we're harvesting our own animals, selling our own beef. And so there is more marketing side. There's more challenges to that. But once again, it's kind of like Russell said earlier, you got to start small. We, we're not slaughtering every cow and every calf that we have on our place and selling it in beef. And, and we're not planting every acre. Uh, in, in crops that harvest. So we're doing multiple things, but little steps along that way. And, and it, it is different, uh, but it is sure not something that can't be managed. It's just used to, we worried about how to manage chemicals, fertilizer rates, soil test, all that together to maximize everything. Now we just try to figure out how we maximize our dollars on our enterprises separately. So it's, it's just a different refocus of the management uh, to the system. And, and it comes with challenges, but also comes with great rewards, too. So we've got the farm, the distillery, the new distillery. Uh, we've got a trucking company that helps support the farm to haul equipment and we've Je actually me and Jessica I think we were having bourbon over a zoom call one day and we came up with renegade livestock that's our that's our beef production um, but, but like Jimmy said um, if you're if you're going to go direct to enterprise to consumer just be prepared to educate the public a lot because um, they think we're all trying to kill them and yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it really does take a, another step. And, an, I mean, sometimes it can be a headache, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm okay with dealing that to make more money. I guess my answer is no sleep, and I'm in debt enough. i got to <laughs> keep working. <laughs> you good? Uh, personally, I think this was the best question of the day because I think it's really important for all of us in this room as conventional farmers, we're tired, we're broke, um, we're missing games, life sucks. And the last thing we need to do is flip our farms to regen, but stay in that damn rut. Because this, this changing the way we farm is, is making us more profitable, using less time. We need to be spending that time with kids and family and the community and not renting more ground so we can be millionaires and make up for lost time. It, this is about regenerating ourselves and our families just as much as it is the farm. So, great question. And I was hoping Todd would point out his partnership he has with cattle, because we all know he hates cows. I pretty much just have to keep them watered and check a few fences. And they like say, we, we've teamed up with, with a great guy to work with all the cattle. And that, that's key also, is if you don't want to own the cattle, find somebody to work with. There's a lot of guys out there. And there's, there's uh, points of contact uh, in the regenerative world. It seems like there's, there's conferences and things like this, and everybody's willing to talk about it. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's not competitive, but it's not like everybody's close-minded close about it, and they'll, they'll share their ideas and their failures with you. Todd, you mentioned you got 100% cover crops on your irrigated ground. Has that changed any of your irrigation management practices, how you irrigate, how often, so forth? Severely. It, uh, we save a lot of water up front. 
Um, I don't think we use any more on the tail end than we have, have in the past. We use a lot of moisture probes, um, ET scheduling, still, you know, nothing beats boots in the field with a probe. But uh, it seems like we can, we use a lot less up front planting into that green and having that biomass there. So we just had a question about management. Could you talk about marketing, how you differentiate your products, what what you're finding for direct market channels, those of you that do direct market? You got to tell a story, and, and you got to tell you got to convince the person that's interested in buying your product why they need to invest in you in your in your farm is because that you take care of your soil, you take care of your animals. And just like one of my, my friends says, you know, we want our animals to have a great life in one bad day. And, and, and that, that is so true that, that, you know, and that's what we experienced during, during the wildfire. I, I, I told the story that, you know, we wanted to protect them cattle just like our kids. And, and you got to tell that story that, that you're fostering that growth and, and, and it's a system of life. And, and and, and that's a big challenge as you're marketing your products, uh, but it's also a very good story. And, and now is the time for that because of supply chain issues out there. There's so much opportunity that people want to know where their food is coming from and is it healthy and is it chemical free and all that other questions that come along. And, and you just got to be truthful, and that's where it takes time. And, and I was telling Russell, you know, you got to put your arm around and say, <laughs> you got to understand that, that we love this farm. We live here. We, we don't want to do anything to hurt it either. And why would we sell you a product that will hurt you? And so that's, you got to tell your story. And, and as ag, we, we've, we've lacked in that that we never tell the, the, our true story and put ourselves out there. Uh, and, and when you do, of course, you're in the limelight and you're on the front page there, but just be truthful and tell your story and, and they will come. You build it and, and truly they will come. You don't have to do it on your own either. Um, you know, the meat and a lot of the things we, we did in the beginning on our own and you know, we just partnered up and we came up with the idea for Regen Mills and Heritage Grain. And that's 18 farmers across 14 states. We have one e-commerce site, but that's now 18 farmers voicing to 18 different sets of regional customers, brands, you know, different climates grow different crops and get a community effort behind it. That's, that's probably been the easiest. And, and I know farmers don't typically are not prone to doing that, but um, take time and, and, and build something together and it makes it a whole lot easier. Um, Jimmy alluded to um, the microbiome in human health in relation to soil health. And in my mind, I think the biggest kind of connectivity and how we get this to masses is human health. Do you all, do you speak to that in terms of your community? And do you, do you market your products um, in relation to the, the importance of human health in relation to soil health? Yeah, so <clears throat> we've made some connections over the years uh, and there's some great people across the country where it be, you know, Zach Bush or, or Daphne Miller in California or Aaron Martin in, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma that have made that connection that, that people's health is dependent on the food they eat that's dependent on where it came from and the soil it was grown in. And so, yes, that, that, and that's the reason that, that we just done a podcast together to tell that story. It's all about healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy humans. And, and, and I think that's, that's very critical that we understand a, as a nation, and, and you can look at the numbers however you like to look at them, but the trend of our human health is going this way. Our soils are going this way as a whole. Not, no, you know, there's several of us that's going the other way, 
But as a whole, nationwide and worldwide, we're going down. And that correlation is, is just printer side by side. And much like the slide that we saw earlier, you know, you destroy your, your soil, you're going to destroy yourself. And, and so I think that's, we, we, Nicole, we really got to push that issue that, that it, what we're doing is for the health of everything. It, it's the health of the biome and the soil. It's the health of the biome and the gut. It, it's all tied together and, it, and it's, it's, we've screwed that system up and de destroyed it and degraded it by taking all the organic matter and all the carbon out. And by doing that, we, we've messed our entire gut and our entire health system up. And so we've, we've got to tell that story and we've got to rebuild that. It's, it's critical. I truly believe it. All right. This is probably going to be the last question. Where can we find that podcast? <laughs> so we, we've got it out there on YouTube. And it's called Conscious Aging under Aaron Martin. It's also under me as well. So you can Google, Google either one of them up. Uh, it's brand new and out. Uh, and, and we're going to do more of that. And we're actually working on a presentation uh, where we can share that at, at a stage like this down the, down the road. It tag team together. We're, we're going to. Like I said, it's just out. We just shoved it out on my social media, hers, uh, and LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all that, and Instagram. So it, it's out there. And I can go. I'll post it on our social channels for this event along with, um, I think she's going to be speaking at No Tell in the Plains uh, in January, too, in Wichita, Kansas. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. And I must say that listening to all of you up there, I have great hope in what we're talking about. And if you stay tuned, the very last panel, it's going to be a little bit shorter. We're going to be talking about these new market opportunities. We have two companies in particular that are going to be talking to us about what this all looks like when we talk about building new markets, um, going direct, et cetera. So stay tuned for that, and we're going to take a little bit of break. But please thank uh, my panel members.